As a lawyer, I start out with a disclaimer, and because that's what I do. Um, the purpose of the presentation is simply to alert you to legislation that may be of interest to you. It's not meant to be a substitute for reading the laws. And let me make sure I get. The DLGF will be shortly issuing uh, memoranda on all of the topics. We will do it by topic and we will start actually tomorrow issuing these memoranda. The memoranda will um, recount the law that it came from, what code section it is affecting, it will tell you the effective date because some can be retroactive, some can be in the future. Most, however, are in, it will take effect in July of 2013, as you would expect, but there are some differences. The memoranda that will be issued will, be, uh, will cover all of those kinds of issues. And so this is meant to be kind of just an overview, an alert, so don't try to to gather everything from this. I can tell you I have not memorized all of the, the legislation. Um, it's still in flux, as we know. Um, in your materials, you have uh, 1546, which was, as we know, vetoed by the governor. Um, the legislature will come back in June, so there is a possibility of that um, being, being over overridden. We don't know at this point. I will, however, skip over the material in 1546 because as of right now it is vetoed. If 1546 is overridden, we will of course issue um, uh, memos on that and alert you to that, um, how that actually is going to go. So um, just keep in mind that this is supposed to be an overview, but we will give you an intense and um, more useful um, kind of overview of the new law. Now, as we issue those, um, I, I had a, a wonderful conversation with one of your number who said when they get those, those memos, what they do is they put them into a binder and index them by topic, and then it'll be like 2013 legislation, and they index them by topic, and they have that out there for people to use so that they don't have to try to remember didn't they do something with the Homestead circuit breaker issue and it just pop open, the, open their, their binder and I, I thought that was a brilliant idea and I'm going to do that myself because couldn't possibly memorize all this stuff um, at this point anyway. Um, as I said, 1546 was vetoed by the governor. Let's get into some of the legislation. This is, is in no particular order, except that um, 1116 was our bill, and so it goes first. Um, 1116 amends Indiana Code 6 1.1 17 16, so that the DLGF is not required to hold a hearing before setting the, budget, the unit's budget, except as provided. Now, what that means is, obviously, um, those budgets have been well vetted by the time it gets to the, the DLGF hearings. And I know that we used to sit in the rooms with all of you and usually some people in the unit, and no one would show up. And we would drive for three, four hours, however long, rent cars, and it was just, it was just wasting taxpayer money. However, if a taxpayer would like to have a hearing and you know if they want it, it that's fine they will either contact you in the auditor's office and if you get a request for a, a hearing from the DLGF um, then you have two days to send it on to us if um, or they can just send it directly to us and we will conduct a hearing in the county so we are not foreclosing the idea that there could be a budget hearing. It just won't be automatic, and we will be saving quite a bit of money um, for the taxpayers. It just didn't make any sense to be to be having that, and so I, I think that this is a, a good thing for everyone. Eleven sixteen, as many of these bills do, a whole hodgepodge of things, and one of the other things that it does is that it amends six one point one twenty point six nine point five. 
to eliminate the provision requiring the auditors to notify each political subdivision in which the circuit breaker credit is applied of the reduction of property tax collections. Just one less thing that you have to do. House Enrolled Act 1568. I'm just going to keep going through this because, like I say, you will get the intents. I just want to give you an overview and so you're kind of thinking along these lines. House Enrolled Act 1568 adds an alternative urban homesteading program. And it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with auditors, except that the auditor must provide the agency that's going to be administering this new alternative urban homesteading program with a list of properties that have delinquent um, installments on them. So that's a, it's a little thing that you have to do, and it's probably not something that you would think about you know, with respect to an urban homesteading program, but it is something that you are required to do under 1568. Um, that same bill also amended 6-1.1-24-6.8 regarding the sale of vacant parcels by the county such that the county auditor must collect the purchase price from each successful tax applicant and prepare a deed transferring each vacant parcel to the successful applicant if the conditions, normal sale conditions, are satisfied and if the vacant parcel is unimproved, the county or township assessor must consolidate vacant unimproved parcels that are sold and the contiguous parcel um, owned by the successful applicant into a, into a single parcel. So if, if a, a contiguous landowner goes ahead and buys one of those properties at a tax sale, um, the, the assessor is required to make those into a single parcel. Senate Enrolled Act 275. Now this is this is a little bit different, and it requires, and this is it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, it requires the county auditor to remove a tract of real property from a certified tax sale if the county treasurer and the taxpayer make a written agreement for the payment of tax of delinquent property taxes. So that's going to take a lot of coordination between the offices. Um, and I think that I would hope that being a kind of a new program, um, that there would be some, some real good cooperation as soon as the treasurer um, gets that agreement signed, that he can get a copy over to your office so that you know to take that off the tax, the tax sale. Um, that's especially important, and I, I hope that you coordinate with your treasurers on, on this issue because um, if you do sell it, then you have the issue of you know um, the tax sale purchaser um, who was, didn't know, and, and if you didn't know, um, there could be an issue of interest and things if there is a, a tax sale where there should not have been. So coordination between the, those two offices is absolutely critical. Um, under the law, under the new law, the county treasurer must provide you with a copy of that written agreement um, before, you, before you have the tax sale. So it's, um, it is incumbent about, upon the treasurers, and we will be getting out. These memos go out not only to the auditors, but obviously to the assessors and, and to treasurers and anybody else who, who needs to, to see them. So it's not like we have to hope they find out about this. They will. Now, Senate Enrolled Act 459 adds Indiana Code 36-1.5-40.5, which governs reorganization that includes a township and another political subdivision. If all or part of a municipality in the township is not participating in the reorganization, and yes, this has happened, uh, not less than 10 township taxpayers who reside within the territory that is not participating in the reorg may file a petition with the county auditor so that you know what's coming. If you say, what in the world is this? You know what that is. Protesting the reorganization 
reorganize political subdivisions, township assistance levy. They think it's too high or they think it's too low, unlikely, but possible. Um, they will send a petition to you together with their other data necessary to present the question to the DLGF. So if you get something like that, um, we know there is, there is one township out there like that right now, but there could, there could be others. As, as we see more and more uh, reorganizations um, coming up in, in Indiana, and there have been a significant number of reorg bills that are going to make it pro easier and, and perhaps a little bit more fair for um, political subdivisions to reorganize. And so I think in the future you're going to see a little bit more of that. And so you will probably, you are likely to get these petitions in the future. Senate Enrolled Act 544 um, amends basically Kajit, Coit, and Seedit so that the, the the commissioner of the DOR determines that an, an, an ordinance that imposes, increases, or decreases, or rescinds a tax or tax rate was not adopted correctly or is deficient, the commissioner must notify the county auditor that the, aud that the ordinance was not adopted correctly and specify the corrective action that must be taken for the ordinance to be adopted correctly. And the ordinance may not take effect until the corrective action is taken. It also amends 6-3.5-1.1-9, Kajit Coet seated, so that before August 2nd of each calendar year, the budget agency must provide to the county auditor of each Kajit Coet seated, um, adopting county an estimate of the amount determined that will be distributed to the county based on known tax rates not later than 30 days after receiving the estimate of the certified distribution, the county auditor must notify each taxing unit of the estimated amount of property tax replacement credits, certified shares, and other revenue that will be distributed to the taxing unit during the ensuing calendar year. Before October 1st of each calendar year, the budget agency will certify to the county auditor of the adopting county the amount plus the amount of interest in the county's account that has accrued and has not been included in the certification made in the pre preceding year. The amount certified is the county's certified distribution, as usual, for the immediately su succeeding calendar year. The amount certified must be adjusted. Not later than 30 days after receiving, oh, let's see, not later than 30 days after receiving the notice of the amount of certified distribution, the county auditor must notify each taxing unit of the amount of property tax, replacement credit, certified shares, and other revenue that will be distributed during the ensuing year. SEA 544 also amends Indiana Code 6-3.5-7-27 so that if a county council adopts an ordinance to impose an additional tax for renovation of a county courthouse, the, count, the county auditor must, not, not more than 10 days after the vote, send a certified copy of the ordinance to the commissioner of the, of the Department of Revenue, the director of the budget agency, and the commissioner of the DLGF in an electronic format approved by the director of the budget agency. Obviously, those things have not been done as of yet because we're still in flux. Um, but it, it basically, you're going to have to send some sort of email um, with respect to um, such an ordinance. SEA 544, which does a lot, um, also amends various sections to require that the result of votes on any of the ordinance to adopt, rescind, increase, or decrease, Kajit can only be sent in electronic format prescribed by the director of the budget agency um, to the commissioner of DOR, director of budget agency, and the commissioner of the DLGF. So I think we're, uh, what this is basically saying is we are definitely moving away from um, 
we're definitely moving away from, from paper. It's good for everybody. It gives you a record. It gives um, all of the agencies a record. And um, we can't say we didn't get it from you. <laughs> you can say, yeah, yeah, you did. And, and here I can prove it. So I think this is, um, while it takes a little bit of getting used to, I think we're, we're moving in, in the right direction. Um, it gives us all the, the cover we need, and it also provides us with um, a way to, to make sure that um, we, we have our records straight. We don't lose these pieces of paper. We, we all we keep our, our records straight, and, and we do what we need to do um, to get these things taken care of. Uh, the same legislation adopt, amends um, various portions of the code so that if the county uh, council adopts a low freeze tax rate, a public safety low it, or income tax for property tax relief, um, the results of the votes, again, can only be sent in electronic format. Again, that has not been determined, but again, to the budget agency, um, to the Department of Revenue, to the commissioner of the DLGF. And the same, the same law does pretty much the same thing um, with respect to um, the COET. SEA 544 also amends the statutes which govern COET and CAGET in specific counties to require the same electronic notification in Howard, Scott, and Monroe counties. It also amends various statutes so that when a county council votes to impose, increase, or decrease, rescind, cede it, the results must be sent to the commissioner of the DOR, budget agency, and DLGF, also in electronic format. So even though that's kind of tedious to go through, it just puts you in mind of of what, ha what has to happen in the future. Now, I'm sure that the uh, budget agency will be getting that information, how they want that out um, to you shortly. Fifteen forty-five amends the Homestead Deduction Statute. Now, this is kind of interesting, and it's basically um, it's basically a reaction, um, as, as some things have been, um, to the DLGF's uh, guidance in the past that if there was not a, a building or a homestead existing on um, March 1st, that there could not be a, a homestead for that year. Um, that, has been, that has been changed in this new legislation. Uh, it adds subsection P, which says, and I will read it because it's complicated, an individual is entitled to the deduction under this section for a homestead for a particular assessment date if either the individual's interest in the homestead is conveyed to the individual after the assessment date but within the calendar year in which the assessment occurs or the individual contracts to purchase the homestead after the assessment date but within the calendar year, so in, in other words, if the, if the property changes hands just in any particular calendar year, so in either case, whether, they're, whether it's an actual title change or whether we're just talking about um, a, a contract purchased. And two, on the assessment date, the property on which the homestead is currently located was vacant land. So if it was vacant on March 1st, but eventually in that year there is a homestead, that homestead, that particular piece of property can get the homestead deduction for that year. I, I know that can be difficult, um, especially as, as we get occupancy or you know, notice occupancy uh, later on in the year. But um, they, they, you know, the legislature perceived that this is something that was necessary uh, for, for people in a particular year. 
if it was vacant or the construction of the dwelling was not complete. And again, we used to, I know we told you in the past that, and it was in the law, in the past we had said no, if the building is not complete and there was no dwelling, there was no homestead on March 1st, you can't give them the, the homestead deduction. Under this new law, you can. The individual must file this certified statement in other words, the application on or before December 31st of that year to claim the deduction, or they'll file with their sales disclosure form before December 31st of that year. They must also list any other property that would have otherwise received the deduction and cancel the deduction on that, on that property. This is giving, obviously giving um, homeowners or people who are building their homes um, a lot more leeway than they had in the past. So um, we, are, we are certainly grateful for the guidance on this. Um, we, you know, in, in giving you guidance in the past where, there, where a piece of legislation doesn't address something, we do the best that we can in, in making a determination as to as to the guidance we should provide for you, but when the legislature or the courts, and heaven knows some of our, our guidance has been overturned by the courts and probably will continue to be overturned by the courts, but we do the best we can until we get guidance, and then we're always grateful for the guidance because then, then there is no question. Um, so, um, yes? as non-residential land and improvement, does this mean that even though it's not completed, that's, that's what turns it into resident is the certificate of occupancy, does that mean they need to give the values to us as homestead eligible? Well, it, all this says is that a person who um, has basically has a building completed, a, a, an actual homestead, by the end of the year can actually get the homestead deduction. It does not go, it doesn't go anywhere beyond that. So we can't extrapolate from that. All this says is if somebody comes to you, so um, anything else that, that was, you know, a procedure in your county that does not deal specifically with this homestead deduction has not been changed. Um, so, you know, whether or not that will have to be, you know, dealt with in the future um, is, is still a question, but this only deals with the eligibility for a homestead deduction, nothing more. Okay. Okay? Thanks. An individual who satisfies the requirements to get a homestead under this new law is entitled to the deduction under the section for the homestead for the assessment date even if on the assessment date on which the homestead was currently vacant, vac was vacant land or the construction was not complete. The county auditor must apply the deduction for the assessment date and for the assessment date in any later year in which the homestead remains eligible for the deduction. A homestead that qualifies for a deduction under this section as provided in the subsection is considered a homestead for purposes of the supplemental deduction and for the 1% tax cap. The county auditor, so it affects the deduction, but the du deduction automatically affects those other two, the supplemental deduction and the 1% tax cap. So keep that in mind as, as something that this particular new law does. Remember, we will give you memoranda on all of these things and you will, you will have that to refer to. The auditor must cancel the deduction under this section for any property located in the county listed on the statement filed by the individual. In other words, if, if the person was living somewhere, getting a homestead, um, their house was, was built in, you know, was finally finished um, in November that year, they moved in um, for the Christmas holidays, um, and, you know, you will, take, you will take the deduction off of the other property and put it on this one. The county auditor must, who receives this application must forward it to the, to the county auditor of, of any other county 
and the county auditor of the other county should cancel the property a homestead that was on that property for that that particular applicant this law also amends 6-1.1-12.1-1 which governs the definitions for the deduction for rehabilitation or redevelopment of real property in economic revitalization areas. So that wherever a, a definition defined property or installment equipment installed before or after a specific date, reference to that date has been removed. That's all that's happened here. Um, so there is not a date restriction on that, on the, the, the equipment or the installation. It also amends Indiana Code 6-1.1-12.1-2 so that the designation of an area as residentially distressed has the same effect as designating an area as an economic revitalization area, except that the amount of the deduction must be calculated as specified in 6-1.1-12.1-4.1. And that formula is there, and it will be, of course, in your in your um, memos. And the deduction is allowed for not more than the number of years specified by the designating body rather than five years. The designating body was obviously given a lot more leeway um, in this, and so it is not limited to five years anymore. And just provisions and references to, to old days have been, have been deleted, as you would expect. It also amends some of the other statutes related to eliminate provisions or references to old dates. And it also deletes the provision whereby if an area is residentially distressed, the deduction period is not more than five years. It also removes the exceptions, which were basically wholesaler permits to the prohibition on liquor store uh, receiving a redevelopment or rehabilitation deduction. So um, in the past, a, a wholesaler, basically a liquor wholesaler, could get that particular deduction. That has been removed from, from statute, and so a wholesaler, a liquor wholesaler, can no longer get that deduction. Fifteen forty-five also amends. 6-1.1-12.1-4, so that the amount of the deduction, and this is the, the calculation I was speaking of, so that the amount of the deduction equals the product of the increase in the assessed value resulting from the rehabilitation or redevelopment multiplied by the percentage determined under 12.117, and it deletes the old deduction formula. Don't bother to memorize it now, or any, you will get that, but just know that there is a change in the formula. It amends 4.1 as follows. This applies to a deduction approved before July 1st for the redevelopment of property located in an ERA that are residentially distressed, subject to section 15. The amount of the deduction that a property owner is entitled to receive for a particular year equals the lesser of the assessed value of the improvement to the property after rehabilitation has occurred or the following amount. And then you see the amounts for one family dwelling, two family, three, fa three four, so on. This subsection applies to deductions approved after June 30th of 2013 for redevelopment of property in an era that is residentially distressed. The amount of the deduction the property owner is entitled to receive equals the product of the increase in the assessed value from the rehabilitation multiplied by the percentage determined under Section 17. Again, those formulas are, are, will be handed out to you. No need to just know that they're different than they were. It also amends 6-1.1-12.1-4.5, which prescribes the abatement schedule. 
It eliminates the current tables and requires a, the use of a new schedule. It also amends 6-1.1-12.1-4.8, which governs the vacant building deduction. It eliminates the existing formula and requires the use of the new schedule. It also amends various provisions to delete old dates, as you would expect, and it makes uh, technical corrections to 12.1-11.3 due to the repeal of 12.1-16, and obviously repeal 16, and it amends section 17 to read that a designating body may provide to a business that is established in or relocated in or relocated to a revitalization area and that receives a deduction based on the following factors. The total amount of the taxpayer's investment. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think I'm on, I think, I, th I, think I'm, I'm, I think I'm up to where we are. Um, the total amount of the taxpayer's investment in real and personal property, the number of new full-time jobs created. I mean, they're, they're looking for some actual value here. The average wage of the new employees compared to state minimum. The infrastructure required for the taxpayer's investment. So what they're looking for is in the past, we've seen many of these, these kinds of um, abatements, and, but we didn't always see the value that, that we had hoped to see in, in the counties. Um, now they're looking for some, some real value um, in these kinds of, when, when you give something as a county, you should get something as a county, and it should be in the form of uh, jobs or an investment in equipment or, or something that, that actually elevates the, the, uh, the, the status of, of workers, taxpayers. Um, and, and so we should be seeing some, some more benefit from these kinds of abatements um, in the future. And I think this is a, a really good start on that. An abatement schedule um, must specify the percentage amount of the deduction for each year of the de deduction and abatement schedule may not exceed 10 years. So in other words, we're again giving the, um, the designating body a lot more um, authority than they did before. They can basically tailor things to, um, to what this particular project is and it's not dictated um, as it had been. An abatement schedule approved for a particular taxpayer before July 1st 2013 remains in effect until the abatement schedule expires under the terms of the resolution. This section also adds 6-1.1-20.6-1.2 to define common areas for the, for the purposes of circuit breaker. Again, this is pretty much a reaction to the, the, the um, guidance that the DLGF had given on um, common areas. Again, we're, we're glad to see the guidance. We're glad to, to have someone tell us what they want to be defined as common areas because we do the best we can when, when we're not given um, specific directions. And so this, this specifies and it, it takes the guesswork out of what is a common area. For purposes of circuit breaker credit, as used in this chapter, common area means any of the following. Residential property improvements on real property on which a building that includes two or more dwellings, a mobile home or ma manufactured home is located, including all roads, swimming pools, tennis courts, basketball courts, playgrounds, carports, garages, other parking areas, gazebos, decks, and patios. That is different than, than what we had told in the past. Um, we're happy to have that, that guidance now. Now there's no question as to what should be common, what is, is considered common area for the purposes of circuit breaker. All the land and appurtenance to the land in connection with a building or structure described above including the land that is outside of the footprint 
of the building, mobile home, manufactured home, or improvement. Remember, in the past, the DLJF had said it was basically just the footprint, the, the land under the footprint of the building. That is no longer the case. This section also repeals, or this law also repeals the coal combustion product income tax credit, and it also repeals um, the credit which which provides that a taxpayer that obtains the credit may not obtain a coal combustion product property tax deduction. I'm kind of running out of time here. I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, amends 6-1.1-26-5 so that when a a refund is claimed on property tax payment. The interest must be computed using the rate in effect for each particular year covered by the refund. Um, and I, I believe that um, Debbie probably co um, covered this area, these areas with you before, so I'm not going to spend um, too much time on this. I think that's in your material so that you can look at that. I want to make sure that we can get on to something that, that Debbie had not already covered with you. So let me just move ahead. Um, I'm going to skip through 1546 because look at how much there was um, because as, as you know that that was vetoed and so it's in your material should that veto be overturned and we will issue a memo should that be the case but right now that ve that bill is vetoed and we are not going to spend time on it. Um, SEA 517 that has a lot of stuff in it and it's 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 all all interesting. Um, the $50 penalty that a taxpayer could be charged for failing to appear at an assessment appeal hearing has, may not be added to the property tax statement. Now, the good thing about that is that um, you're not going to have delinquencies based on that, that simple thing. Um, it, it just, that will have to be billed separately. I, I believe that State Board of Accounts has already given some guidance on how that should be billed. Um, but that will, that cannot be put on the tax statements. Um, a school, a school corporation that conducted a referendum after November 1st, 2009, before May 1st, 2010, for distributions after 2013, county auditor must distribute proceeds collected from an allocation area that are attributable to property taxes imposed after being approved by the voters in the referendum to the school corporation for which the referendum was conducted. The amount to be distributed to the school corporation shall be treated as part of the referendum levy for purposes of setting the school corporation's tax rates. It also amends um, six dash 1.136.17 so that upon collection of the adjustment in tax due and any interest and penalties after the termination of a homestead deduction or credit, the county treasurer must deposit that amount in a non-reverting fund if the county contains a consolidated city, obviously Marion County, or if the county does not contain a consolidated city, which is the vast majority of, <laughs> of you folks, in the non-reverting fund to the extent that the amount collected after deducting the direct cost of any contract, including contract related expenses under which the contractor is required to identify homestead deduction eligibility, does not cause the total amount deposited in the non-reverting fund for that year to exceed $100,000. So that's, that's your top end of that fund. Or in the county general fund to the extent that the amount collected exceeds $100,000. That may be deposited in the non-reverting fund. Any part of the amount not collected by the due date must be placed on the tax duplicate for the affected property and collected in the same manner as other property taxes. The adjustment in tax due after the termination of a deduction or credit must be deposited only as specified in the first year in which the, the amount is collected. The amount to be deposited in the non-reverting fund or the general fund includes adjustments to tax due as a result of, de 
of the termination of the deduction or credits available for only for property that satisfies the eligibility for the standard deduction or homestead credit. Any amount that exceeds the amount required to be deposited shall be distributed as property tax. It shall be treated as miscellaneous revenue. Distributions shall be made from the non-reverting fund upon appropriation by the county fiscal body and may be made only for the following purposes. Fees and costs incurred by the county auditor to discover that the property is eligible for the homestead deduction, whether or not they are, for the homestead deduction or credit, other expenses of the offices of the county auditor, the costs of preparing, sending, and processing the notices of removal of the homestead. The amounts deposited in this particular fund, the balance of the non-reverting fund and expenditures from the non-reverting fund may not be considered in establishing the budget of the office of the county auditor or in setting property tax levies that would be used to fund the, office, the county auditor's funds. So, yes. You can, it, you, if you have um, 150000 in that non-reverting fund now, you can keep that? It's just going forward or? I, I have to look at the, the, uh, the date of, of, of um, enactment on this. Okay. Um, if you can write that down. Sure. Um, when we will we'll get you written answers on all of that. But for right now, it looks like the non-reverting fund will will be topped out at $100,000 and then the rest of that money will be moved over into the general fund or the, or a reverting fund. Okay, didn't okay. mean to put you on the spot. I know it's That's, that's okay. I, yeah, I, do, I just, I looked down and I did not have the, the, the date of, of We of do when have that, that question in the question box for Friday. So okay, we'll coordinate our answer with you and, and we'll try to get you some specific directions on how to make those deposits in the non-reverting fund. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Um, and the last thing, and I think you're going to like this one because this is, this is where I started the last time I talked to you and I told you I had bad news. Well, I've got good news. Um, 517 amends Indiana Code 6-1.1-20.6-2 so that for purposes of the circuit breaker credit, homestead refers to a homestead that has been granted a standard deduction <laughs> under, under 6-1.1-12-37. This makes things a lot easier. This, this is a change um, from and probably a reaction to, as we all know, the IBTR ruling that we talked about last time. So when I said that I had some good news to end up my presentation with, I wasn't kidding. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and I appreciate it. Thank you.